Welcome to this video series on using e-ink for productivity. Now, if you came here from the main channel, which I would presume you did, then you know basically what we're doing. But if for some reason you got here without that, uh, check out the card up below. There's a link in the description. The purpose, the introduction of this as a topic is more ancillary to a bigger announcement for the channel. But in any case, you're here. Welcome. We are going to talk about this. This is the Onyx Books Max 2. Very, very easy name. And this is a 13.3 inch e-reader. It is marketed primarily as an e-reader, but the more interesting thing about it is, of course, that it runs Android. So this isn't simply an e-reader, it is also an Android tablet. So basically, if you've used Android, you can pretty much get used to using this device with a few huge, colossal catches, which I will get to in time. This being the first video about the, about the device, it's mainly just going to be a brief overview of some of the things that I have gotten working on it, as well as some of its more general features. So I'm going to not really have you where you are right now on a tripod. No, wait, you're gonna still be on a tripod, but mainly you'll just be looking at the display rather than everything behind me. And then we'll test a few things out. How's that sound? I think it sounds great. Let's get going. We'll begin where all great things begin at the beginning. Now, this device, I am using it for purposes that it's really not meant for. It's meant to be a high-end e-reader, an enormous display for an e-reader, very big e-paper display. Let me, for comparison's sake here, that is the Sony PRS505 next to it. It is gigantic compared to that. So this is uh, if you want to give, it's very similar in dimensions overall to the original iPad Pro, if that means something to you. It doesn't really to me, but hopefully it does to you. So this is a very, very large tablet that just happens to have an e-ink display. Now, first things first. If you are going to use this like I'm using it, be prepared for some pains because it comes with basically nothing ready to go. For instance, a lot of the settings are in places you may not expect, and it's very much just a case of play around with it and see what happens. For one of the first things that I had to figure out was how to enable a lock screen, because I want a lock screen on this thing. I'm putting my Google accounts in it. Obviously, if it gets lost, I don't want it so easy for someone to just start messing stuff, messing stuff up. So it took me a while to figure out how to get that to work. Now, one of the more annoying things about this, again, it's primarily an e-reader. If you touch home, it doesn't bring you to your app drawer or your apps area. It brings you to your library, which of course is empty because I don't have any eBooks on it. Every single time you want to select an app, you have to go back to apps, which is a bit of a pain, but eh, what are you gonna do? Um, the touchscreen itself is actually quite nice. It has a capacitive layer. One of the downsides is that it has more glare than perhaps... <laughs> well, here I go, can't demonstrate the glare. There we go. Um, it's, it's more reflective than like the completely naked e-ink display on the Sony reader. But it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't really make the image cloudier or harder to see. Overall, it's excellent. And of course, it also has the electromagnetic Wacom uh, stylus to go along with it, which I will bring down in a moment. I don't have it with me right now. So because this is an Android tablet, you can run pretty much any apps that you want to run. And uh, that there's a huge asterisk there because not all of them are stable. For instance, Chrome really is not happy on the tablet. Firefox is though. So for a web browser, I've been using Firefox. Now you'll see it has a built-in browser and that is better for general purpose browsing. I'll get into this stuff more when I um, have a more in-depth video for you that talks about the review. But uh, for now, just know that apps are gonna work pretty okay, but not necessarily fantastically. But for the most part, they do. For instance, I can open the YouTube app and it actually, looks like you would expect. It's in black and white, it looks like paper, but it works. And bizarrely enough, it actually will play videos. So let me just pick one. How about this one right here? Now, obviously, playing videos is not this device's forte, and it's completely screwing around, not really know what to do. But if you switch the screen to what's called A2 mode with this little toggle there, 
Now it actually can kind of play videos. It's a very low frame rate, but it does work. Now the downside to A2, you can see where his hand is moving, it's leaving a ton of ghosting because A2 does not refresh the screen as a whole, but that's the reason it's able to move this smoothly. Big asterisk there. Uh, and let me just stop this here. And when you go back to normal mode, then it will refresh the screen, everything looks nicer. But on A2 mode, it does not do that. It, it really doesn't do that at all. And the purpose of that is apps run better. And that's one of the big downsides about this device. And that is that for third-party apps, it doesn't have a very good way of knowing when it should switch to A2 mode. So let me just give you a quick demonstration of that. Also, these, I wish these buttons weren't quite so small. If I, and again, that didn't bring me to my apps, I have to go back to apps. So if I open Firefox, I'm just gonna open up Wikipedia here, grab an article. You'll see that it's running kind of slowly, things are loading at weird times, but you know, it does work. So if I want to search for something, let's just look at, I don't know why this came to my head first, but go for. You'll notice that the suggested searches aren't appearing. There's like one weird thing here, but uh, nothing came up. But if I hit the little search key, now it shows up. And the article loads pretty much as you would expect. Great, fantastic. But if you want to scroll, nothing happens. It just does not respond to scrolling because it's still in that normal mode. It doesn't automatically switch to A2. If I manually switch to A2, now what will happen is I can scroll smoothly and it works like you would expect. But then you get the ghosting and the only way to get rid of that ghosting is to hit the toggle twice, go back to normal, then back to A2. And this, the reason why this is frustrating is that the device's built-in browser, all right, I'm in normal mode now. The device's built-in browser will recognize that you're scrolling and switch to A2 and then go back to normal mode once you've stopped. And it's frustrating because they haven't built in a way for the device to know to do that on third-party apps. So third-party apps, you just have to be going back and forth between A2 and normal manually. I don't see any reason why that couldn't be fixed with a software update, but uh, the latest software update for this device is in December. So not a lot of hope there. But again, it's, it's just rather annoying because the, its own browser is smart enough to realize you're scrolling, switch to A2 mode, and then once you've stopped, refresh the screen, go back to normal. Because um, A2 mode doesn't really look terrible, but it doesn't look as good. So like the grayscales here, you actually have grayscale on this image of the Cardinal. If I switch to A2, funny enough, this actually looks slightly better because of the way that it's rendered, but A2 is actually one bit grayscale. So every pixel is either black or white. So it's more like dithering, it's not grayscale. So usually images don't look as good in A2. This is kind of a bad example because there's many gradients here. But the built-in browser, like I said, it's smart enough to realize you're scrolling go to A2, you've stopped scrolling, go back to normal. And I don't know why third-party apps can't work like that. And the, the big bummer is this browser is based on Chrome, but it's an older version of Chrome, so a lot of stuff doesn't like it. And the big reason why I want to use this as a tablet is so that way I can get to Google Docs. But again, this is more about the stupidity of Google Docs. The Google Docs interface on for an app is just not very good. Let me pull something up for you. And right now nothing appears to be happening, so I'm gonna to switch to A2 mode. Again, it's, it's not a great experience, let's be honest. I may just not have a very good Wi-Fi signal right now. This isn't the app that I meant to open. Oh well, this'll work. So, uh, I mean the document that I meant to open. Google Docs on tablets, very frustratingly, doesn't look like the desktop site and it doesn't have the tools that you really want to be able to edit uh, documents. So for instance, page breaks aren't visible. 
It's just one giant thing of text. And I really do not like editing on this on the app. So if you go to toggle to write, you know, then you get some basic stuff up here, but it's really just not optimized for a tablet. It's really optimized for a phone, which is a colossal bummer. But, but because Firefox works and Firefox is a new enough browser, I can actually get to the online interface for Google Docs and it looks how I want it to look. Again, we have the problems where the device doesn't know to switch between A2 mode. So this looks really, really nice right now, but to make it more usable, I have to run it in A2 and you lose the gray background. It just doesn't look as nice. But you are able to, on an app by app basis, increase or decrease the contrast, which is good. There are also settings for animation and stuff, which I thought might help with my smoothness issues, but it turns out that I have no idea what those do and they don't seem to make a difference. So, you know, when you're running in A2 mode, you can scroll just fine. Again, you get that ghosting, which is really frustrating. But really for text editing, it's not that bad because most of what you, once you've scrolled enough, it's basically just the center area becomes a little bit grayer. And if you want to refresh it, you just toggle that twice and it will work. The other really dumb thing, which I don't understand, is that when you're in normal mode, if you touch the clock, it does an on-demand refresh. You just have to touch the clock. But if you're in A2 mode, then that doesn't work. Touching the clock does nothing at all, which is stupid because this is the mode where you would want to have an on-demand refresh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of dumb, but anyway. Let me back out of here, or let me just say, this experience is not great, but it does run natively on the tablet and with the Bluetooth keyboard and the stylus, it's actually pretty easy to write with this. The one, a couple of weird things have happened. When I first installed Firefox, the tab bar was black and now it's white, which is fine, but the little add a tab thing is gone. It works. If you touch that area, then it creates a new tab but um, it's not visible, which is, you know, less than ideal. But um, that's a minor thing. And I haven't played around with themes to see if that might help with stuff. But yeah, anyway, let me, before I close this video out, I'm just gonna show you the other function that it has working as an external monitor. All right, now I have not even tried this yet. And a lot of reviews mention that the cable it comes with doesn't work. So there's a great chance that this isn't even going to work at all. But let me plug this in here. Now to use it as an external monitor, there is an app that you actually have to use. So again, we're going to go to home, apps, and then monitor. Oh, well, this isn't plugged in very well here. There we go. Now it's gonna tell you that you really want to plug it in when you're using it as a monitor, which makes sense because um, it's gonna use a lot of power. But as you can see, my desktop has indeed showed up over there. So good stuff so far. All right, now one of the things that I have heard about this, which is definitely true, is input lag is bad. If I'm moving the mouse, this is something that you just have to get used to. It moves, I would, I think about 300 milliseconds after you actually move anything. So that's not exactly great, but let me um, first see if I can get the display, let me see if I can get the display settings uh, more optimized for it. Okay, perfect. So I've switched it to only use this display and it has already figured out its resolution. What does it think it is? I don't know why. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna have it extend the displays because this is weird. So it's, oh God, we gotta flip these around. 
This is definitely clunky. It feels weird to use it like this, but I mean, honestly, it's working, which is more than I, <laughs> more than I might expect otherwise. So display two, what, it's interesting. Okay, there we go. Resolution 2104 by 1560. And we're gonna scale this up maybe to 150. Yeah, that's better. You know, it's interesting because Windows scaling isn't perfect, but I keep hearing people say that it sucks real bad. And myself, I, I really don't think it's really all that terrible. Oh, is it really? Oh, I didn't. It thinks this is. Wait a minute. Yeah, you're too. Okay, that's. I did this to myself. All right, so now that I have it set up how I want it, let's just play around with some stuff. Um, I'm going to open Chrome up. This is the script. Oh, that doesn't really highlight very well. This is the script for the video that introduced this topic. And yeah, you know, it looks it looks pretty good. The contrast is not great. Hmm. But this this might actually be one of the better ways to use this is to just hook up uh, hook up my laptop to it. But I would want to figure out how to make it the primary display, and Windows doesn't seem to like to do that. So I might need to play around with this a little more, but. In any case, it can indeed be used as an external monitor. The worst thing is the input lag is pretty freaking bad. And I could get used to that, but a lot of people like really, really hate that. So if that's something that you are, um, you are concerned about, this is probably not for you. But it did work. It works surprisingly well. And um, yeah, I mean, geez. I'm pretty impressed, actually. Uh, one thing that I want to try to... Okay, so you can switch to A2 mode also over here. No, that's not what that did. That just refreshed the screen. Hang on now. Okay, okay. So it will do a full refresh. That's annoying at most every five minutes, so you have to do a, if you want to force ref, whoa, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to leave, go back to the monitor. I know. Holy, why is it all wrong now? Okay, I don't know why that happened, but anyway. So apparently the monitor runs in A2 mode by default. You can still see all of the apps that are ghosted there in the back. But um, it, it does function, and there, the, the other thing that people were talking about was the Dasung e-ink monitor, which is literally just a monitor. And the thing is, it's like $500 more almost than this device, and all it is is a monitor, whereas this can actually function by itself a little bit. So this is uh, the introduction to this device. We will see how things go, how I like it as we continue on with using it. But... Um, I will, what I said is definitely true. This is by far a not great device. You have to make a lot of sacrifices if you're going to use this as an actual productivity device, but I'm willing to try it out to see how it may help with my sleep problems. And honestly, if um, with a Bluetooth keyboard, which I haven't shown you in this video, but it does work pretty well, it's also kind of cool to be able to just take it outside and work outside with perfect visibility of your display and it doesn't affect the battery life. The one thing that I will say though is that um, its battery life just isn't great in general, but that's because it's not really meant to be a tablet. It's primarily trying to be an e-reader. So if you have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on all the time, which I would using it as, a, you know, a truly functional tablet, then it burns through battery pretty quickly. But um, 
Uh, I, I haven't really timed it, but I would think you could probably get five or six hours use out of it using it like a tablet, not like an e-reader. But if you have Wi-Fi off and Bluetooth off and you're just accessing the uh, content that's on the device, then you know it still works like an e-ink e -ink display because it is one where it's not technically right now, it should be using almost no power. It's just because it's maintaining a Wi-Fi connection and a Bluetooth connection, it's going to be doing that. And um, so it's, I'm kind of a weird case for using this because I'm using it in a way it's really not meant to be used, but that's what I want to try and do. So we'll see how that goes. And I will continually update things as I go along. The next video about this, I'm going to talk about all of the things that I had to do to get this even where I found it acceptable because there were a lot of things. For instance, just to give you a quick taste, so the screen does not auto rotate, which is rather frustrating. So I have this app installed called Rotation Control. Another frustrating thing is even though I have it set to start automatically when the tablet boots up, it doesn't. So I have to go in there, turn it on, and then you see an icon in the status bar. If you open up the status bar, now you can actually change the screen orientation. And rather frustratingly, I, I shouldn't be in here when I'm demonstrating this because this doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work on the uh, actual interface of the tablet. So you can see the screen orientation I had to now changed in Firefox. So now the status bar is up top like it should be. Now it's to the left, but whenever you are, I keep forgetting what I need to touch. Even when you have it correctly set up in landscape, then what happens is if you go back to the home screen, it re rotates back to portrait mode, which is frustrating. And it may it may be that it does not have a hardware accelerometer in there at all, so maybe that's not to be maybe that's not so much of a surprise, but it's frustrating nonetheless. So, like I said, there's a ton of sacrifices you're making if you're going to try to use this as a productivity device. So, for 99.9% .9 of people, I would say no, no. But I think this is a useful proof of concept that e-ink can actually work as a general purpose display if the software is written well enough because it's definitely not on this and if it has a powerful enough processor backing it because the thing is a lot of the times where this device gets annoying and slow it's nothing to do with the display it's just its hardware is you know pretty mediocre so i hope that you enjoyed this video and that you will continue on with me as we or as I learn whether or not I like this and see if it helps with my sleep patterns because I, you know, I'm not convinced that it will, but definitely the first day I used this and I was setting this up, I did notice this was not, I, I felt much more tired using it than I have ever felt with a computer. And so I think there is some merit to it, but I just can't say for sure. But anyway, I will chime in a little bit later. I'll tell you all about the things that I needed to do to get this just functional. And uh, as, we, as I move along in this experiment, I'll keep you updated. Thanks for watching.